Hi, so this video is going to be about surge protection devices. Now surge protection devices are not new and they have been used on the continent and in uh, particularly in Australia for quite a long time uh, but the 18th edition of BS7671 um, has introduced the thought of using these in consumer units for domestic applications. So although it's not mandating that these should be used um, it's kind of saying that if you don't use them and something blows up you should have had a risk assessment to say um, you know why you didn't need them uh, and the Basically, the, the reasoning is if the cost of installing one of these is greater than the equipment it's going to protect, then there's probably no point in installing it. Otherwise, you may as well go ahead. So all of the wholesalers are starting to stock these devices. Uh, and what we've got here is two examples. So the one on the left here is from China. And this cost £3 uh, delivered. And it came in about four days, which is amazing, uh, especially over the Christmas period. So um, yeah, that's an absolute bargain. Um, and what we've got next to it is a BG uh, British General surge protection device from Screwfix and these are currently retailing for about £75 and what I couldn't get my head around is what on earth could be in one of these that costs £75 uh, that the Chinese are doing for £3 and I really suspect all there is in here is either one or two uh, metal oxide varistors uh, to absorb uh, surges and then probably some kind of um, spark gap device or, or some other um, surge arrestor that will allow you to um, dissipate much higher currents, um, well particularly on this one. So th there is one difference, this is a single pole device, uh, I didn't realise at the time but this only protects the phase conductor so um, what we've got here is a, um, a device that will clip onto the DIN rail, um, you have one terminal which is connected to the main incoming earth um, and then this one connects to the live bus bar um, technically through a appropriately sized MCB uh, to protect this in case it uh, you know blows its blows itself up in the event of a big surge and then this one is a two pole device so you connect the live uh, the phase and the neutral uh, into the top here and again we've got the connection to the main earth at the bottom so um, they do sell these in, in two pole versions, they're double width, um, I didn't realise that at the time. So they're not quite the same but they're basically going to be the same um, inside other than the fact that it's not got um, two pole protection. So what I'm expecting in here is, yeah, like I said, just maybe uh, a large metal oxide varista and possibly a uh, gas discharge tube or something like that that can be used to shunt much higher currents. You know, this one's rated up to 60 kiloamps, so metal oxide varista is not going to manage that, so there must be some, uh, some other mechanism. And then on the BG device, um, you'll see it says from live to neutral, it can uh, support up to 5 kiloamp surges, which is most likely a metal oxide varista, that's quite standard. And then between neutral and protective earth, uh, up to 40 kiloamps, so that's more likely to be your gas discharge, discharge tube. But even still, um, those components don't normally cost that kind of amount of money. Um, so I'll be really interested to see what's inside this and how the two compare. So we'll start off by looking at the Chinese one, and it's got a fairly modular construction. I think the idea is basically you install this into your consumer unit or into an enclosure next to it, um, it doesn't really matter. Um, basically what you want is a fairly short distance between um, the live connection coming in and the incoming uh, main supply so that the surges are shunted uh, as soon as possible rather than um, a longer length of cable. But I think, um, I think it's in BS7671 that the distance should be around 30 to 50 centimetres max. But this is uh, a two-part construction. So it, the idea is that this can be installed and then when this blows up, uh, there's a little indicator on the front, um, you can get a new one and slide it in. Um, and that can be presumably done by the user rather than getting an electrician in um, because you don't have to touch the wiring. So um, yeah, there's nothing really else to say. It just clips on the DIN rail uh, and we've got the two connections, um, the two wiring connections. So what I'd like to do is have a look what's inside one of these. And I'm particularly keen, so there's, there's a little green thing here, which I don't know. Uh, there's a gap for it here, but it doesn't seem to trigger anything. Um, and then I'm not actually sure what could cause um, this to change colour. 
Um, it suggests it involves a moving part. So unless there's a fuse or something that explodes, um, yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what's inside. So I'm just going to have a look and see if I can work out how it separates. It looks like we might be able to prise it apart just here. Um, I'll try with a pry tool first and then we might have to get a bit more heavy with it. All right, so let's see if we can separate this out. Oh, there we go. It does look like it's going to pop open quite nicely. So we'll have to get the Dremel or the, uh, the hammer of truth out. And there we go. So unfortunately, <laughs> it looks like it's potted, so we're not going to be able to see fully what's inside. Um, so we've got the two large connections here. We can definitely see what looks to be a metal oxide varista in the potting compound, but that unfortunately is that very hard potting compound that we're not going to be able to uh, see inside. So I'm just trying to see if I can see what could cause the, uh, the green thing to trip. So I'm not sure if it's clear, you can just about see a red marker in here which suggests that um, this would have to fling down. And um, the only way that it could possibly do that is if this heats up enough that this soldered connection uh, releases this, uh, yeah, releases this strip of metal because, you know, this isn't going to move, this is potted into here. And, um, yeah, that's the only other moving bit. So clearly it's relying on it overheating enough and this getting up to 300 and, uh, well, yeah, about 300 degrees enough for this uh, solder to melt and it to pop down. Um, so we might be able to simulate that with the soldering iron. Let me uh, just get the big tip in the soldering iron. Right, so I've just put something in front just to uh, contain the blast because I suspect that when we melt this and this goes flying down with this little spring, we might see solder flying that way um, towards my computer monitor. So um, let's try heating it up and simulating an overheat condition. Just kind of loosely hold it in place. And there we go. Didn't actually break the, uh, the connection, so there's a solder whisker there but that is now showing red. Um, so yeah, uh, unfortunately we can't see inside the, uh, the potted area. There's definitely uh, what looks to be a metal oxide varista. Um, and that would be what would cause this to get hot because uh, when they're dissipating lots of power, they do heat up. They're basically just resistors. Um, so yeah, unfortunately not that much to see in this device. Um, so let's take a look at the uh, British General device. Right, so this is a fairly similar affair. So um, this is designed to clip onto the DIN rail again. It's definitely uh, a better construction. I can certainly feel that it's not made from quite such lightweight plastic, but it has the same kind of uh, overall construction. Obviously it's got um, more poles for connection because um, we're breaking two conductors. Um, it's, it's possibly uh, divided into two sections inside. Um, but we'll have to see if we can get the cover off this. I'm not sure if this one's going to be quite so straightforward, although there is some kind of locking me mechanism just here. Um, it doesn't look like it's qu quite going to be as straightforward to separate. So. quite chewy plastic there. I might be able to peel it back with some cutters. Just 
be enough to get the splodger in. I've got a bit of separation here. Oh, there we go. So let's see. Not a lot. It's basically the same thing, just not potted. Um, and in fact, it's the same. It's the same release mechanism. So we can see we've got a uh, a uh, surge protection uh, TVS type device. Uh, so on this side, which way we've got it? We've got phase coming in, so this is on this side, and that's going through, that has no connection directly to uh, protective earth on this side. That goes through to this side, and um, yeah, this, so yeah, this is basically a gas discharge tube. A bit like the ones that are in the, uh, the BT sockets for lightning arresting. Um, so, yeah, so, that, so this is the, the TVS which can only dissipate a small amount of power and then going through to um, this gas discharge and then again both of these when they get hot they're releasing these little uh, red flags by just heating up the solder on here so they're really not very sophisticated and this is certainly not worth the, uh, the £75 that Screwfix are charging. I, I don't think it's just Screwfix uh, all of the wholesalers are going to be uh, selling these for the same price. Um, but I'll just draw out what we've, we've actually got here. Right, so the way that you connect this device up is you've got your incoming, uh, incoming main supply. It goes into the main service head um, and you know, passes to the meter. So we've got our meter here with all the dials on. Uh, and then this passes through uh, to the consumer unit. And the way that you typically install this is you've got your main switch uh, on the side of the consumer unit and what they would recommend that you do is you provide some overcurrent protection um, so that this doesn't just catch fire because the, the main switch on these consumer units is purely an isolation device, it has no overcurrent protection. So prior to this the only uh, protection you've got here is the, the uh, 60, 80 or 100 amp service fuse which actually will blow up considerably more than that. They don't blow you know, the 60 amp fuse isn't going to blow when you draw 61 amps, it would probably blow um, after some sustained period of 80 or 100 amps. Uh, you have to have a look at the fuse curves, but it's basically a piece of piece of wire that heats up and, you know, that's going to take time to heat up to the point where it's going to melt. So, um, so what they recommend is you put in an MCB, um, anything less than uh, 32 amps, and it might seem counteractive that you've you've got this on its own MCB, but when the uh, MCB short, uh, you know, turned on, it's effectively a short circuit directly to um, the, the phase conductor that's coming in. Um, and the transients that this is going to be suppressing are, you know, far smaller than the, the response time of one of these MCBs. So even if the MCB does activate, this will have arrested the surge, um, unless it's a, a direct lightning strike, in which case you've got no hope anyway. And then, um, so you've got this device here, and you've got the protective earth which is coming in from uh, wherever, it might be your earth stake or it might be uh, a PME supply or a TNS or something like that. Uh, and then this is hooked into your 32 amp breaker and then this is hooked into the, uh, to the neutral uh, which comes straight from the main switch. Um, and the way it's working is um, you've got your live which is coming in after the 32 amp supply and Basically, I think what we've got is um, like a, a transorb type device, a metal oxide varista, effectively. Uh, we've got our neutral, and that's probably um, just through this um, sort of gas discharge type tube and then down to, uh, down to ground. So that's it. And then um, these soldered tabs are basically just providing... Um, you know, a means of isolating this device when, when it goes tits up and it's no longer working. So these are sort of these are sort of thermal switches, but thermal switches based on a bit of solder and these tabs heating out, up. And then obviously these are spring, sprung uh, to try and uh, clear the, the fault as quickly as possible if it's got to the point where this is getting really hot. 
So, um, I mean, yeah, this is exactly um, what we've got here. And there's not really much else to say about it. There's, uh, you know, you can buy these components for a couple of pounds. You could construct your own and it's perfectly conceivable that this device here is uh, going to do exactly the same job. Uh, if anything, I'd say that this is possibly, um, you know, a slightly better mechanism. Um, but yeah, there's there's really not much to it, so we may as well just get this one to uh, to trigger as well. This is the uh, the phase side. Is it going to heat up? Ping. That's just one. So interestingly, it only um, isolates sort of one pole at a time, uh, but that's fine, I suppose. And again, we can just trigger the neutral side. We may as well. And there we go. Seventy-five pounds. So I hope that was interesting. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot more of these installed in consumer units and no doubt plenty of uh, naughty electricians are going to say that these are mandatory and force people to upgrade their consumer units. Uh, obviously they're not necessary unless you're um, installing a new consumer unit and um, the equipment connected is worthwhile. So I hope that video was interesting. Uh, thanks for watching.